perfectly with me. No okay, objections. Okay, thank you. <laughs> On my part. You're welcome. So we have seen that in NPs, it's a good idea to go for this X bar structure. And of course, then the natural question is, well, if this is how NPs works, maybe other kind of phrases work like this, VPs, adjective phrases, etc. In, in general, in, in linguistics, we would like uh, our models to be elegant and simple. And it would be so nice if uh, verb phrases and noun phrases worked in the same way. If it was the case that noun phrases as, as well as verb phrases are binary branching, have this intermediate n bar or v bar structure, etc. So this would be nice, but let's see if this is really the case. And then we looked at this nice VP, often sings opera loudly at church. I don't know how usual it is to sing opera in a church actually, but whatever, maybe, maybe in the US, I don't know. And um, what we have seen that in, when it comes to verb phrases, what we can do, we can replace uh, parts of it with this does so uh, thing, which is a bit like a pronoun. So just like one was a pronoun, do can be regarded as a pro verb or something like that. And, uh, and we, we went through this, we checked whatever can be replaced with this does so too. And once again, we have seen that uh, um, parts of the VP which are not constituents can be replaced. So the indication is that this structure, this flat structure is probably not very satisfactory in explaining the facts. And so we try the same trick. What happens if we represent verb phrases as well as binary branching and in between the VP and the V, there are these multiple V bar levels, so to speak. And it turns out that this does the trick for us very nicely. So we can replace V bar constituents with does so. Okay, there is one interesting bit here, the top. So why is it that VP is not branching in two directions? Why is it that it only goes down and there is nothing here? That's an interesting question. And uh, later on, we will see what's going on here, but for the time being, this has to remain a secret. Okay, and I think this is sort of where we stopped. So let's see if we have further evidence for this uh, V-bar structure. It's nice to have, uh, in linguistics, in any kind of science, it's nice to have uh, many pieces of uh, independent evidence. One evidence was this do substitution. Let's see if we have further evidence. Okay, so what's going on in this tree? Imagine this sentence, um, John eats beans and tosses salads with a fork. Okay, now, What's interesting here is that if you think of it, this video fork is supposed to combine with eats beans as well as with tosses salads, right? So both activities are done with a fork. So how can we represent this nicely in a tree? Of course, this whole thing is a VP. So consider this sentence, John, what does John do? John eats beans and tosses salads with a fork. 
So this whole thing is a VP. So far, so good. This is one thing that we know. The other thing that we know that this PP with a fork seems to do double duty, so to speak. It uh, belongs to its pins. It also belongs to Tossi's salads. And this V-bar structure gives us a nice way to represent this, because what we do is this. Well, there is one V-bar, is beans. There is another V-bar, Tossi's salads. We connect the two with a conjunction. We get a higher V-bar. And then this V-bar is being modified by the PP. And that's how we can draw a tree which correctly captures the observation that this PP belongs to both its beans and tosis sons. There is one thing in this tree which is probably not so elegant. What do you think? What looks a bit not so ideal in this tree? The conjunction, maybe? Yes, what's wrong with it or what? Um, we talked about binary branching last time and, and we have a, a three type branching here. So. Mm, yes, that's right, exactly. So once again, this is, I mean, this is not the final say we have about this structure, but as it is right now, Ulrika is right in pointing out that we have a, we have a ternary branching happening here. Now, there are two ways to go. Either we say that in general, there is only binary branching, but conjunctions are an exception. That's possible, but of course, we don't like theories to have exceptions. The other thing we can do is we can sort of sit down and think very hard and try and find some way to do this thing in a binary branching manner. And actually that's that's what people have done. So maybe if, if we get there, we will see how a conjunction structure can be represented in a binary branching way. Okay, so this was VPs. So we had, we looked at noun phrases, we looked at verb phrases. Now, Let's see what happens in PPs. Um, I'm not sure how this is convincing, how convincing this is. So, so the book itself uh, admits that anyway, so let's look at this sentence. Tara is very in love with her boss. Now, first thing, this sentence doesn't look okay to me, but I'm not a native speaker. I don't know what you think. Very in love. That's, doesn't this sound strange? A little bit, yes. Yeah. So actually, ver Tara is very much in love, that's fine. But very in love, that's uh, pretty weird. So I'm not sure. And actually, you see, the author of the book admits that this is actually an idiom in love. So it's a fixed expression, not a general story. OK, but. Um, Anyway, I'm going to, going to skip this, okay? Because this is not so convincing. And uh, anyway, you can read it in the book, but just very quickly, what's happening here, we look at this very in love with her boss. So this is a PP, in is the head, very is a modifier and love and with boss, these are some other elements. 
a naive approach would be to say that we have a flat structure here. And then we do some substitution tests. Mary was very in love with her boss, Susanna was less so. So what so uh, substitutes is this, which is not a constituent. So seems like the flat structure doesn't work. And then we check if some other part can be substituted and indeed it can. So you can say, I don't know, Mary is in love with her boss, but less so with her husband. So so um, substitutes this. And uh, anyway, so this again can be solved if we have this P bar structure. Okay, so it seems that what works for NPs works for VPs and probably works for P Ps as well, but this story is like a bit less uh, solid than the story with NPs and PPs. Yes, indeed. Okay, so we talked about NPs, we talked about VPs, we talked about PPs. There are also adjective phrases and adverb phrases, if you remember. So the question is, should it, do these also have a bar structure? So is it the case that between adjective phrase and the adjective head, we can have uh, several levels? Uh, okay. So consider this sentence, Lin is interested in syntax, but less so in phonology. So interested can be uh, replaced by with so. So it looks like we can do this replacement game with adjective phrases as well. So probably there is some intermediate structure there. Okay. Mm, right. There, are, there is some more detail about this in the book, but uh, now we have to proceed. Okay. So this is the whole set of rules we have seen. There is a set of rules for NPs, for VPs, adjective phrases, PPs. And uh, what we see here is that at first sight, this looks like lots of rules, right? Uh, 12 altogether. But if you look closer, you realize that in a sense, these are very similar in structure, okay? If you just look at the first six concerning NPs and VPs, actually, it's almost like you only have to change the letter N to letter V and you get the, the red rules from the green rules. You also have to change adjectives to adverb. So it seems that there is a deeper structure here. And uh, what is this? So what uh, so-called deeper structure, what uh, generalizations can we make? So can we find some uh, common uh, denominator which unifies what happens in NPs and VPs in adjective piece and so on. What are these generalizations? That is generalization one, which says that there are actually three types of rules. So there is one rule which generates the phrase. 
NP or VP or HP. Then there is one rule which is iterating. So for example, an N bar node branches into AP plus N bar, which again branches into AP N bar, which again branches into AP N bar. So this is iteration. This can give us the many, many levels of this phrase. And then there is one rule which sort of stops the game, a rule where we start from an NB node and we branch into a head plus something else. And this is where the tree stops. So there is the first rule where the tree starts growing from the top. There is this iteration rule, which uh, gives us the internal structure. And then there is a final rule which sort of stops the growing. And if you think of it, this is true for MPs, and this is also true for VPs, adjective phrases, and so on. And since, since this is a general pattern, we have uh, certain names for these rules. The first one is called the specifier rule. Okay, the specifier rule. Mm. The second one is called the adjunct rule. And the last one is called the complement rule. And we will see in a second where these names come from. Mm. Okay, but it's very simple, actually. So the specifier rule, so idea is this, we have the NP node, which branches into two directions, the determiner and the N bar. And this determiner is called the specifier, okay? So the, the sister of the highest N bar is called the specifier. Now, sisters to other n bars so n bars other than the highest they are called adjuncts okay so this guy this ap this is an adjunct that's why it is called an adjunct rule and then the sister to n this is called a complement that's why it is called the complement rule okay so let me show you the tree once again so if for uh, running so quickly. Okay, so let's look at this one. Okay. So the sister of the highest N bar, this guy here, this is the specifier, the sister of the highest N bar. Sisters of other N bars, like this guy here, this guy here, they are called adjuncts. And the sister of the, of the head, N, this is called a complement. Okay, we will see what we can say about this. But for the time being, that's, that's enough to remember. So sister of the head is a complement. Sister of the highest N bar is the specifier. And all the other guys are adjuncts. And that's why the rules have Oh, sorry, the names that they do. Specifier rule, adjunct rule, complement rule. Okie dokie. Now, so this was one. And why is this a generalization? It is a generalization because we can, we have the same story in other phrases. So if you look at the VP, for example, here as well, there is, a complement sister to the V head. There are adjuncts, sisters to V bar. What's interesting in this VP is that it lacks a specifier, right? So if there was a note here, sister to V bar, it would be specifier. But for the time being, it seems that VPs don't have a specifier, which is 
strange, right? So if NPs have a specifier, we would expect VPs to have one as well, but for the time being, we can't say what it is. Later on, we will see that actually VPs do have a specifier, but it's uh, special. Okay, so this is a mystery for the time being. But the mystery that will be revealed. Okay, is this clear? The, the first generalization. Then let's see the second generalization called headedness. Very fancy name. Okay. Consider this. We had this rule that an NP node can branch into two directions. Uh, determiner and n var. But crucially, the determiner is optional. It is not always obligatory. Okay, there are some noun phrases which have a determiner, like the hubs. It has a determiner. But then there are other noun phrases, like, uh, for example, John or Budapest. These are noun phrases, but they don't have a determiner. So the determiner is optional. That's why it is in, in parentheses. Now moving down one level, n bar can branch into two directions, an adjective phrase plus n bar. But once again, this adjective phrase is optional. Okay, so you can say the tall boy, and then you have the adjective phrase tall. But you can simply say the boy without any adjective phrase. So the AP is optional. It's in brackets. And finally, the N bar can be rewritten into N plus a complement, but that's also optional. Okay, so you can say the boy from Budapest, but you can also simply say the boy. So this complement here is optional. My point is with this is that if you think of it, the only thing that is absolutely necessary is the stuff which has the letter N in it. Okay. So N head is obligatory, complement is optional, N bar is obligatory, adjunct is optional. And here as well, n bar is obligatory, but the specifier is optional. And this is called the rule of headedness. So as we have discussed, the crucial element in a phrase is the head. This being a noun phrase, we absolutely need a noun head, which grows into n bar, which grows into np. Okay. Uh, Dao, please. Yes, uh, could you please answer that? How we, how do we uh, draw a tree for this case for a compound noun? Uh, ah, okay, compound noun. Like, um, give me an example. Mm. For example, um, cow, no, uh, blackbird, for example. Blackbird. Okay, that's a good question. And uh, actually, it's not an easy one. So let's start from. Let, let me answer an easier one. Okay, so <laughs> cream cheese, that's also a good one. But let's stay with blackbird. Okay, so of course you can say this in a descriptive way, like there is a blue bird, a red bird, and a black bird. And then black would be an adjective, but this is not what you are saying, right? This is blackbird, the name of this species. Okay, so 
Uh, there is one easy way out of this question. If we assume that compound words are built in the lexicon, that's a possibility. So you can say that, you know, language is made up of these modules. There is a lexicon, which is supposed to be a list of the words that we use. There is the syntax, which uh, puts uh, sentences together. There is the semantics, which calculates the meanings. There is a phonology, which deals with the sounds and how they interact. So one way is to say that compound words are actually put together in the lexicon. Okay, so maybe there is a lexical rule in in the in the lexicon which says that the, you know you can put two words together and two nouns together and you get a third noun. Some rule like this. And um, actually I would be sympathetic to such an analysis. I, I'm not an expert on compound nouns, but I would probably say that compound nouns or most of them are just simply put together in the lexicon. You just copy one after the other. And because of this, they don't have to follow the rules of X bar. But uh, I'm not sure uh, this is the most you can say about compound nouns. So maybe, actually, let me check. This is interesting. Uh, syntax compound noun. I'm not sure there is something on this. Uh, yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give me a minute. Uh, can we say that in this case, um, black is the complement of bird, and uh, we can draw the tree like um, you, you, you show me in the chat box. Oh, well, of course, the the problem with this is. And I think that's why you, you you are mentioning it right here, is that one NP is supposed to have only one head, right? So for example, the, the beautiful car in the garden, this has only one, only the car is the, the, the head there, right? And then a problem with the seafood or, especially seafood, which is noun plus noun, because C is a noun. Uh, that is example. So the problem with seafood is that this looks like two nouns. So should we say that this is a two-headed uh, phrase or something like that? You know, there is a two-headed eagle uh, in the... That was some, some royal symbol, right? The two-headed eagle. So, so may, maybe uh, there is... Um, there are two-headed phrases, but... That's why I would say that, that uh, a, a, a compound noun like seafood, what happens is that sea and food are combined in the lexicon into seafood. If you think of it, this makes sense because if you open a real dictionary, you have a separate entry for seafood, right? So, it, so it's not like you have to find out for yourself. You will have an entry, there will be an entry for sea, there will be an entry for food. There will also be an entry for seafood. So I think this sort of makes sense that that uh, that the compounding happens in the lexicon. And then when we start doing the syntax, we simply take seafood as a noun and use it in the phrase. So the syntax doesn't care that seafood was uh, put together from two components. Syntax probably doesn't even know that seafood is made up of uh, two components. Syntax treats seafood as a noun and it's not looking into the internal structure. And, and maybe that's the case with Blackbird as well. 
So as far as syntax is concerned, it treats Blackbird as just a noun and that's it, it's not interested. If you think of it, it's not, Blackbird is separable, right? So syntax cannot uh, put anything in between them. You cannot say a blacker bird, blackest bird, um, and, and so on. So this would be my answer. I had to uh, improvise a bit and, and think on my feet. But my answer would be that uh, compounding probably happens in the lexicon and yeah. compounds are not, uh, the internal structure of compounds is not visible for syntax. Yes, I got it. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you for the question. I, I really had to think about this. Very good question. Okay, uh, Linda, please. Uh, uh, relating to the DAO question, uh, Professor, if we said that uh, Blackbird, we know that we can uh, draw it into the noun phrase in the tree. Or seafood is the one word. But how about the, for example, component, we say uh, tennis shoe. Tennis shoe is the component noun. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Noun. So this one, uh, how can we draw it? Blackbird, we can draw in the noun press. Mm -hmm. One yeah, is at the end, one is noun. But how about this one is two noun? Well, that's a good question. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. One option is to say that tennis here is actually, it works as an adjective for some reason. Okay, so it's like, what kind of shoe? Blue, black, tennis, football. So actually that's what I would do. So even though tennis in itself looks very much like a noun, I would say that um, in a structure like tennis shoe, tennis is actually an adjective. Okay, and uh, maybe we can say that uh, if there is an invisible operation which turned the noun tennis into an adjective, it's, I don't know. What would be interesting to see if there is a language where the word for tennis shoe, if, if you look at tennis shoe in, in some language other than English, maybe there is some marking on tennis which signals that it has turned into an adjective. I don't know, it would be great to have such a language where tennis shoes uh, look like, I don't know, tennis shoes or tennis ish shoes or something like that. Okay, but, the, but, yeah, but that's, that's a tricky question. And I th the only way out I see is to say that tennis in this case works as an adjective. But of course, then you would ask me, well, if it works as an adjective, why does it not look like an adjective? So why, why is this not tennis shoes or tennis sh shoes? And I, I don't have a convincing answer. So this is a good question. This is a bit of a riddle. Yeah, thank you, Professor. So some cases of compounding are easy to analyze, others are less so. Okay, very good. Uh, maybe the other thing is that, the, so some compounds are now compounds, but they started as, uh, as um, adjuncts. So for example, look at blackbird. So blackbird means a species of a bird and it is a compound, but probably historically, it just meant a bird of black color. And then it got amalgamated and the two, and it became a compound. So maybe tennis shoes is like between these two stages, it's, uh, between a real compound and a modified structure. Okay, but uh, moving forward, uh, I don't want to digress too much. The important thing is that in an NP, what is obligatory is um, the noun head 
and the N bar and the NP level, of course, and all the other guys are optional. Mm. Yes, uh, I agree. And of course, the other rule, which is sort of quite obvious, it is called endocentricity. It says that an NP is built on a noun head. Okay, so it's impossible that there is a verb head and we end up with an NP. So an NP is built on a noun head. That's pretty obvious. And the second rule was uh, optionality connected to what we have discussed just before. So with the exception of heads and everything else is optional. This is one thing and it is phrasal. Okay, what do I mean by this? If you think of it, all these optional guys, the guys in brackets, they are phrases. Adjective phrase, prepositional phrase, or going back, noun phrase, adjective phrase. All the optional guys are phrases. There is one difference, the determiner. So I said that determiners are well, optional in the sense that some noun phrases have determinants and others don't. But what's interesting is that determinants are not phrases, right? They are just simple words. We will talk about why this is a case in chapter six, but in general, um, the optional stuff are phrases. Okay, so this is the third um, generalization uh, we can make. Now, so what have we done in the last couple of minutes? And, and actually yesterday, last week as well. So we looked at the structure of NPs, VPs, PPs in more detail. We found that we need a binary branching structure in each case. And uh, so this is a similarity between NPs, VPs, and PPs. And now we have found other similarities, like the fact that uh, mm, what were these other similarities? The three generalizations, actually. So, so that we have, in each case, we have the specifier rule, the adjunct rule, and the complement rule. We found that headedness is also common. So an NP needs an N head, a VP needs a V head, and so on. And we have also seen that other than the head and the bar node, and the highest P node, all the other stuff is optional and all the optional stuff are phrases. So these are generalizations which are valid for MPs, VPs and so on. So can we then draw up a simple and elegant system based on these generalizations? And the trick to do this is uh, a bit like mathematics. We are going to use variables, okay? So think of this, I give you an example in the chat. For example, in mathematics, two plus three equals three plus two, right? And uh, seven plus nine also equals nine plus seven. And this is a general principle in mathematics that if you have addition, you can change the order of the elements. Now, how can we express this in a general fashion? Well, we can do this by using variables. X plus Y equals Y plus X. 
right? So instead of using actual numbers, we use these variables to express the general idea that addition is, um, I think commutative is the verb. So in addition, the order of the elements doesn't matter. We can express this using variables. That's what we are going to do here in syntax. So instead of using noun or verb or adjective or preposition, so instead of using NVAP, we use a variable such as X. So just like in this uh, example, which I typed, X can be any number and Y can be any number. Here in syntax, X can be N or V or A or P. And that's how we get to the specifier rule and the adjunct rule and the component rule written up in a general way. So there is the specifier rule, there is some XP, which can branch into two, YP and X bar. There is the adjunct rule, X bar can branch into two, ZP, some phrase, and X bar. Okay, and ZP can actually come after or before X bar. We will see this in a minute. And then there is a complement rule where we say that X bar can branch into X and WP. Okay. And just like in mathematics, you can substitute. So instead of X, you can put N here or V or P, etc. This is how we express these rules in general terms, abstracting away a bit from noun and verb and preposition. And um, that's why this whole system is called X bar theory. Okay, so I hope this is clear what we are doing. Just like in mathematics, we use a variable to express a general principle. So X could be N or V or Edge, or Adv or P. Okay, and this is what it looks like in a beautiful tree structure, right? So there is the head at the bottom. This could be noun or verb or preposition, whatever. There is a complement to the head. This is some kind of phrase, prepositional phrase, etc. These join and give us an X bar node. This can be N bar, V bar, whatever. We can have an adjunct. We can have another adjunct. We can have even more adjuncts. And then here at the top, what we have is the highest X bar node. It's sister, which is a specifier. And these guys together give us the top of the phrase XP. So what we do here, we grasp the fact that noun phrases, verb phrases, preposition phrases have the same underlying structure, which if you think of it is quite beautiful. This uh, suggests that language is to, to a large extent logical. And how substitution works? Well, we can put, we can say X equals N, and we simply copy N into all the places where X was. And that's how we get a noun phrase. We can put V there, then we get a verb phrase. We can put edge there, we get an adjective phrase. We can put adv there, we get an adverb phrase. So I think this is just beautiful. M maybe you could, uh, you know, like set this up as your screen scraper, screen saver, this, right? Looks great. Uh, certainly for linguists. And, uh, yeah. And this is actually the end 
of course not not of the whole class and not not even today, but by the end of this uh, chapter in the book. So we looked at phrases. We did these constituency tests. In this replacement with one and do so and so. These were tests which uh, told us what chunks of a phrase are constituents, and these tests convinced us that we need intermediate structure in phrases. So between the top, the NP, for example, and the bottom, the N head, there is intermediate structure, these N bar, V bar levels. And we have also seen that non-phrases, verb phrases, and so on, they have some general properties that they share. They share these three rules, the specifier rule, the adjunct rule, the complement rule. They share the fact of headedness, that a head is uh, obligatory. And they also share the fact that modifiers are optional and phrases most of the time. And that's how we ended up with proposing this common X bar structure. Okay. There are, of course, questions, open questions, but we will discuss them later. Okay. So let me just... Uh, Yeah, so let's now look at this X bar theory in a bit more detail. So based on uh, these observations, we came up with this X bar theory. Now, what exactly does this mean for the structure of language? Mm, okay. What are the properties, so to speak, of X bar? Uh, so if you remember, we had the specifier rule, we had the so-called adjunct rule, we had the complement rule. Mm, okay. Uh, of course, the fact that the, we have these different rules sort of predicts that there should be some difference between three kinds of modifiers, specifiers, complements, and adjuncts, okay? So remember, we said that in a structure like this, YP here is a specifier, WP is a complement, ZP1 and ZP2 are adjuncts. Now, for the time being, these are just separate labels, but the fact that we gave different names to these guys suggests that probably their behavior is different. Otherwise, it would make no sense to give them different names, okay? So there must be some difference, some linguistic difference between a complement and an adjunct. There must be some linguistic difference between a specifier and an adjunct. Let's see if this is really the case or not. Mm, okay. Is it really the case that these three kinds of modifiers differ or not? That's what we are interested in. So what are the formal definitions that we can make? Well, a specifier, as we discussed already, it's uh, daughter of X bar and sister, uh, daughter of XP and sister to X bar, okay? Daughter of XP and sister to X bar. An adjunct is daughter of X bar and sister of X bar. Okay, so this is the difference between specifier and adjunct. Both of them are sister to X bar, but specifier is daughter of XP, and the adjunct is daughter of X bar. Okay. And complement, 
very simple, a complement is a daughter of x bar and a sister of x. So this is a clear formal definition, so far so good. Now let's look at a concrete example. The young student of linguistics with red hair from Phoenix. Okay. So can someone tell me what is the specifier here? What is the complement here? And what are the adjuncts here? Dao, please. Yes. So the specifier of the um, nephra is um, the determiner. The That's right. Yes, the adjunct here. Uh, Adjective phrase young um, and uh, um, provisional from phonic, uh, provisional with red hair, and complement is uh, of linguistics. Mm -hmm. That's right, exactly. So, thank you very much. There is the specifier of linguistics is a complement and young and from phoenix and with red hair. These are adjuncts. Okay. Now, uh, yes, that's indeed the solution. Okay. Yeah. One important word to learn at this stage is projection. So the idea is that the core of the phrase is the head and everything else are projections of the head, growing from the head in a sense. So N is the head, this N bar is a projection, this N bar is a higher projection, this is an even higher projection, this N bar is even higher than that, and NP is the maximal projection because that's where it stops. Once we reach NP, then the phrase is full. So we have the head and we have the projections. Mm, okay. So based on this, we can define a so-called principle of modification. Okay, so if an XP modifies some head Y, then all this must be modified uh, dominated by some projection of Y. Uh, what does this mean in practice? Mm -hmm. Okay, this means that a student is modified by of linguistics and all this gives us n bar. Student of linguistics is modified by with red hair and it gives us n bar. Okay, so if we modify a head like noun, a student, a noun head, what this gives us is n bar. Okay, so sort of this, the label n is the one which survives all the way to the top. This is the principle of modification. Now, what is the difference between complements and adjuncts? Okay, this is an important question. Uh, so here, for example, compare the student of linguistics with the student from Phoenix. Now, if you look at these trees, of linguistics is portrayed as a complement, sister to N. And uh, a, from Phoenix is a sister to N bar, so it is an agent. But how do we know this? 
Uh, Ulrika says that complements are obligatory and adjuncts are optional. That's right, in a sense. Of course, I mean, if you look at the student of linguistics, uh, of linguistics is not obligatory in the sense that you can simply say the students, the student, and that's it. So it's not uh, not necessarily. Uh, but I agree with you that. Adjuncts are fully optional and complements can be obligatory under certain circumstances. Okay, and then we will discuss how this works a bit later. Now looking at these two, two examples, so how do we know that one of them is complement and another is an adjunct? Well, there is a heuristic. So in NPs, in English, for some reason, if a PP has the preposition of, then it is typically a complement. If it has some other preposition, it's typically an adjunct, okay? But this is just an observation. This is not a foolproof rule. We need some more serious way of uh, uh, checking this. Well, one observation that we can make is that complements like to be, have to be very close to the head. Okay, so look at this. The student of linguistics on Phoenix, that's perfectly fine. What about the student from Phoenix of linguistics? That's pretty bad, right? So you can say, I met a student of linguistics from Phoenix, very good. I met a student from Phoenix of linguistics, that's pretty bad. And this has to do with the fact that of linguistics is a complement and complements always need to be very close to the head. So nothing can intervene between the head and its complement. Okay, and if you think of it, this is quite logical. I mean, look at the tree. We said that off linguistics is a complement, and uh, we know that complements are sisters to the head. So the tree has to look like this student of linguistics, and only then does from Phoenix join in. That's why the correct word order is student of linguistics from Phoenix and not the other way around. Okay, so complements have this property. They need to be closest to the head. Mm. The other difference is that there can only be one complement, but you can have multiple adjuncts. If you think of it, this is quite logical, right? Because a complement is sister to n, the head, and there's only one head, so there can be only one sister of the head. That's why we have only one complement. An adjunct, though, is sister to n bar, and we have seen that we can have many, many n bars. So, yes, so, um, yes, <laughs> let me finish. So, I, that's why you can have more. Uh, there is an interesting remark, and I will get there in a minute. Okay, but in general terms, look at this. The student of linguistics with red hair from Phoenix in the bus. Let's stop there. So here we have one complement of linguistics, and we have as many as three adjuncts. What happens if you try to have two complements? The student of linguistics of chemistry from Phoenix doesn't work. We know what the speaker wanted to say, but it just doesn't work that way. You cannot have two complements. Okay. 
Also, we have seen that a complement has to be next to the verb and cannot be moved. Adjuncts, on the other hand, can absolutely be reordered one to the other. Okay, so the student of linguistics from Phoenix with red hair on the bus, the student of linguistics with red hair from Phoenix on the bus, and so on, all the combinations are fine. The only thing you cannot do is separate the noun from its complement. Okay. Um, what can you do if you want to say the student of linguistics? So if there is a student who is really a student of linguistics and chemistry, what can you say? Well, you can do conjunction, right? So you can say the student of linguistics and of philosophy. That's right, as Wulpen says. Complements can be conjoined with complements, student of linguistics and of philosophy. Adjuncts can be conjoined with adjuncts. The student with red hair and with a tattoo. What you cannot do is conjoin a complement with an adjunct. The student of linguistics and with red hair, believe me, it's very bad. Okay, unfortunately, we have to stop here. Uh, what I would like you to do is, uh, okay, hmm. this is a very important point. I mean, so this is a cliffhanger, right? In a movie, when the when, when you watch a film on television and the advertisement comes at the most uh, exciting place. But unfortunately, we have to stop here. Okay, so I will. Uh, this time I will try not to forget to give you some homework, so I will send you a message here in Teams, hopefully uh, in a couple of minutes actually, I will use the break for this. So I will send you a message on what to read in the book and what the homework is. And uh, then we will continue the slides from here next week. Just one so minute. Can you also um, upload the slides? Please. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's a good idea. I, I should. So I make a note for me. I have to upload slides. And uh, just let me briefly react to Dao's comments. This is an interesting comment. So indeed, we say that an object is the complement of the verb. So I love linguistics. Love is the verb. Linguistics is the complement. And I said that there are only there is only one complement. So what can we say about ditransitive verbs, which have two, which seem to have two complements? Like I gave John a piece of chocolate. There, John is obligatory, and piece of chocolate is also obligatory. So should we say that ditransitive verbs have two complements? It seems descriptively accurate, but it's an exception in the system. So that's one option. We can say that ditransitive verbs are exceptional. Or you can do something else. You can argue that maybe dry ditransitive verbs have some very special structure. Maybe ditransitive verbs are actually two verbs. One which is overt and another which is hidden and maybe they are, there are two complements because each verb, the visible verb has one complement, the invisible verb has another complement and that's how we end up with two complements. Okay, yes because we don't want exceptions in the system. Yes, ditransitive verbs I think are the ones with indirect, ob indirect objects, okay. But this is a very good question with the DAO, but unfortunately we, we've just run out of time. So hopefully next week, if possible, we can talk a bit about the complementation when it comes to 
diatransitive verbs as well. Okay, so I will send you the homework, the readings, and the slides. Yep, here I am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Thank you for okay. that. Okay, so thank I you. thank you and uh, thank you so much, have a nice day ahead and a nice weekend. Have a nice you too. Bye-bye. Nice Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Bye.